All right. Um, you can begin to turn to in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 as, you, as you're turning. And that's where we're going to be this morning. You know, I think sometimes we get a text or an email or a phone call that in the moment just seems kind of innocuous, but it's only after looking back years on it that you realize it set your whole life on a different trajectory. For me, it was 1997. I was actually uh, studying abroad in the Czech Republic. I was, I was in Prague. I remember the office in the, uh, the building of the Vyškola Ekonomika University of Prague, the Economic School of Prague. And I got an email. It was a two-sentence email from one of my mentors and pastor, Keita Andrews. He said, Mark, um, I know you're interested in ministry. Hey, uh, would you be interested in going to Japan this summer and working with Marines? I'm like, man, I did not have that on my bingo card of things that I would do in my life. But I'm like, sure, let's do it. And so I, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I had never done any ministry. I'd never, uh, I mean, I'd studied the Bible. I, I had been a Christian now for about three and a half, four years. And so I got on a plane 24 hours later, landed in Okinawa, Japan, and headed up to the Hanson Christian Center to work with some Marines. Now, I went there thinking I'm, I'm going to go and, and help make disciples. Uh, but I didn't know at the time that it would be those three months of my life that, that I would probably be the one of all the people in that place that would grow the most. I would grow more in those three months than I had in my three and a half, four years of following Jesus. I got to do life for the first time, uh, not just theoretically when I read about how the church was to live together, but, but practically I got to just see for the very first time authentic community. I got to live with uh, the, the, this family called the Arliskis family, the, these, these missionaries over in, in Okinawa that were reaching out to Marines and their four, four children. And I got to sit at their table and I got to see a, a Christian husband and wife interact together. I got to see a, a father love his children, get on the ground uh, and, and play with them. I, I got to see just their life on life that, that, that was just like I was drinking from a, a fire hose. I got to see, um, I got to even see and, and learn what, what repentance looks like. I remember one night uh, I, I heard Drew, the, the father, who's a big guy, he's six foot nine, he's, he's been our men's retreat speaker a few years ago. Uh, I, I heard him yelling at one of his kids. Maybe you've yelled at your kids before. Uh, I, I'm guilty of that. Um, I heard him yelling. I was like, oh man, Drew's hot. He, he's, and that's all I thought about it. And so the uh, next morning I, I, I met with Drew in the office and he's like, hey, I know you probably heard last night me yelling at one of my kids. I just want to let you know that that's not okay. It's not okay for a father to talk to a child like that. And I want, you, I want to let you know that I've, at, at breakfast this morning, I, I asked for their forgiveness. And I want to ask you for your forgiveness, Mark. I was like, well, yeah, absolutely. And I learned that this disciple maker was also a disciple in the making that he's in process as well. And, and that has served me as a father, that, that I should repent when I do sin against my family and, and my daughters and my wife. I got, to, uh, uh, I got to teach a Bible study for the first time. Drew came to me and said, hey, about 20 Marines come out every Wednesday night for Bible study and dessert. You want to teach that? I'm like, Sure. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what that means at all. I've studied the Bible on my own. I don't know how to teach it. He's just like, it's all yours. You decide. Go, go for whatever you want. And they showed up. And, and I, I remember it was on John 15. And, and, and in hindsight, it was terrible. Like I was horrible. And every week they just kept showing up. I think for the dessert more than anything. But, but then... So, so we had some formal things, but, 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 but we had this kind of life on life time. So we, we just spent a lot of time hanging out, eating meals, playing cards. I got really good at ping pong. Uh, I, I, we, we would stay late into the night. We would pray for each other. We would go and, and out together onto uh, right outside the, the gate where, uh, you know, all these bars and prostitutes are. And we, we would share the gospel with people, with, with other Marines there. And uh, we would pray together after and before that moment. Like, like I got to see like, oh, wow, 
I got to see that regardless of how long someone had been a Christian, if they were just open to what God was having for them, God was at work in their lives, working in and through them for our whole community. It was authentic community. I got a picture from that. This is 1998. Here I am, Victor Stevens. Uh, and Stan Brown. Stan Brown is from inner city Philadelphia. Victor is from St. Louis. After getting out of the Marine Corps, Victor went to be a missionary in Tanzania. He then was a pastor in Kansas City for 10 years. I, I, I uh, emailed with him this week. He's been a, a Navy chaplain for the last 10 years. Uh, and, and we've, God has just been, continued to move in those relationships. Just a, a, a sweet, sweet time. I remember one night hanging out with about a dozen guys. It was late, maybe late on a Friday night. And there was this guy, Adam. Adam was about to get out of the Marine Corps. And Adam was kind of lamenting. So so these Marines, they were were called grunts. So if you know anything about Marines, you know what a grunt does. A grunt is trained for one thing, to kill people. Like that's his skill set. Like that's what they do. And praise God. We have people that take on that job. Well, that doesn't translate too well in, in, the, in, in the civilian world all the time. And so Adam was lamenting that. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm getting out of the Marine Corps. And he was just, and we were just kind of, you know, bearing that burden with him and saying, yeah, that's tough. And, and I remember just that sadness on his face. He's like, man, I've got, I've got no skills. I've got no education. I've got no experience. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then his eyes lit up. You could see the light bulb go off in his head. And he looks up at me and he looks at Drew and he says, I know, I could do what you guys do. <laughs> no skills, no experience, no education. <laughs> but I actually love that. I love that. He's just like, you know, what he, what he was saying is like, God could still use me. I could, I could, do, I could make disciples. If, if that. I'm like, absolutely, Adam. Absolutely. After I got over my offense. Um, <laughs> Well, we're, we're in this like, short series as we just turned seven as a church on our mission statement, our vision statement. It's on our website. Here it is, the next one. We are a church that exists to enjoy Jesus and make disciples. And we've kind of broken this up. We are a church that exists. And we just said, hey, that's a big deal that we exist in a time and a place. This is our time. This is our place. This is our moment. Will we as a church be shown faithful in the grand story of God and his redemption of the world. Will we as a church be faithful? And then last week, Pastor Rick talked about to uh, enjoy Jesus. If Jesus is the center of the universe, and he is, if he's the most glorious thing in all the universe, and he is, if he is, if he has made us and he has made, and we were made for him and we are, then it, it makes sense that our highest delight and joy is in Jesus. And therefore our lives should be arranged toward pursuing that joy. And and then we come to uh, today and make disciples. Or or as Pastor Rick said a couple weeks ago, make apprentices of Jesus. This is what we're called to do. Now, I know uh, I've been been in ministry long enough. If there's a part in this uh, vision statement where you think it doesn't apply to you or you want to check out, it's this last part. There, there's a couple reasons. Make disciples. Isn't that for the professional Christians? Isn't that for the extra credit Christians? Isn't that for the people that don't have such busy lives as I do? Isn't that for, you know, so, you know people that, you know, they're, they're just a little bit extra eager. That They're the ones that are called to make disciples. Or you might think of it uh, in, in terms of uh, just a, a small part of what it means to make a disciple. And that terrifies you. You're like, well, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to go up to strangers in the park and, and tell them uh, about Jesus. That's evangelism. That's, that's, that's one part of making disciples. Or I don't want to move to another country uh, on the other side of the planet and learn another language. And, and that's, that's missions. And, and certainly, uh, I'm for both of those things, by the way. Um, you know, one of the things that we, you'll find, that if you will just uh, prayerfully engage a stranger, is that People are dying of spiritual thirst, and we are carriers of living water. You'd be surprised how much they'd be willing. And and, and we're going to be a church that's always going to be about the mission. But that's actually a very small slice of the pie of making disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? It's not just for some Christians. It's for all Christians. 
All Christians have been gifted by the Holy Spirit for a purpose, not just so you can have a nice worship session or uh, feel good sometimes, but, but there is a purpose if you're a follower of Jesus. And here's the deal also. Everybody is a disciple, and everybody is a disciple maker of someone or something, Right? You're already a disciple, and you're already a disciple maker. There, there, are, there are things that you communicate to others that you're trying to get them to follow, right? Whether it's a sports team or a financial strategy or uh, the, the latest product. Like, we're, we're all disciples and disciple makers. And so what we want to just put on the table is, well, well what would, just like we're all theologians, are, are we good theologians? Are we good disciple makers? What, what should we be trying to communicate and forming and shaping in the world? This is what this passage is that I want to get at. Now, the, this idea of to make disciples and to enjoy Jesus, this is actually what we do, are trying to accomplish every single week. So instead of trying to preach what we preach every single week, I, I just want to, um, I want to make it simple today. In fact, by the end of our time, I want to show you three things that you may already be doing, or you may need to just make some small tweaks in your life to, to see what it means that you can actually be a disciple maker and a disciple yourself. So, so that's my promise to you. Three simple things that will actually transform the way we make disciples here at Redemption Parker. So if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to see that the church is this kind of community that makes disciples, that grows as disciples, and and, and preserves disciples. In in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 19, your subtitle might be a call to perseverance, but it's really a picture of uh, both the gospel and how we as a church uh, grow together. So I want to set this up. Now, you may or may not know the, the book of Hebrews. The reason it's called Hebrews is we don't know who the author was. We do know who the audience was. It was first century Jewish Christians. So, so people that had grown up in the Jewish Old Testament system, had grown up in, with all the ceremonies and sacrifices and prayers. And, and now they have come to see in Jesus the, the Messiah. And they've put faith in him. But, but now as life continues to roll out and pressure continues to mount internally and externally, uh, that there is a temptation to kind of go back and, and to even abandon Jesus as the Messiah. And so the author of Hebrews writes this letter knowing what they know about the Old Testament and showing them in every way that, that the Old Testament pointed to uh, was a shadow that pointed to Jesus. So just on repeat, the book of Hebrews is, uh, here's what happened in the Old Testament. Here's how Jesus fulfilled it. Here's what happened. Look to Jesus. Just constantly looking to Jesus. And so that's why he's going to say something that would have been very, very familiar language, but with a twist at the beginning of verse 19. He's going to start with the gospel because the gospel is the center of all that we say and all that we do. But here's how it starts. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Okay, what, what's going on? This, this would have absolutely blown their minds. So, so he says, we have confidence to draw near to God in the holy place. So right away, uh, a Hebrew Christian would have been thinking tabernacle and temple. Remember in the book of Exodus, what the tabernacle represented and the temple, and you would go in, there would be the holy place. But once a year, just once a year on the day of atonement, we read about this in Leviticus 16, once a year, the high priest would be granted access to go behind the curtain and into the holy of holies where the manifest presence of God dwelt on earth earth. This was not a place where you entered into with confidence at all. Uh, First, you had to uh, make, the priest had to make a confession of his own sin. That took a a long time. And then he would sacrifice a bull. He'd put on the the priestly garments and the ephod and and his, his garment would be covered in blood at this point. And then he would take a goat and he would uh, sacrifice it for the sins of all the Israelites. And then they would take another goat and he would lay hands on the head of the goat. And he would confess the sins of all the Israelites for the whole past year. This would take all day. 
just confessing all the ways they had turned away from the living God. And then they would send that goat into the wilderness. It was known as the scapegoat who took the sins away. So covered in the blood of the first goat and then the scapegoat taking the sins away, very fearfully and with trembling, the the high priest would make his way into the tabernacle or the temple, first into the holy place. And that was a daunting place in itself. And then up to the thick curtain that that represented, had imagery of Eden in it. And then with fear and trembling, he would, he would pull the curtain aside and he would begin to make his way into where the Ark of the Covenant was until he could sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice to cover the sins. That They would uh, put a rope around his ankle in case he did something wrong and he died in there. They couldn't just go in and get him. They'd pull his body out. And yet Hebrews says, and since we have confidence to go into the most holy place, why? This is crazy. We have confidence. We have access to the most holy place. How? By a new and living way open through us, the the curtain, through his body. So Jesus, when he dies on the cross, the gospels tell us that the curtain in the temple is ripped from top to the bottom. A new way to God has been made available. And and Jesus is our great high priest. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. This is a picture of baptism. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Here's what I want you to see The author is saying, we, we church have access to the holy of holies. This would have blown a Hebrew's mind. That's only once a year. And one guy, like, who are we? Why? Because the blood of Jesus is is, is perfect blood. It makes a way for all of us to go in. We have access to the holy of holies. Now the question then becomes, how do we access the access? How how do we uh, enter into that space where they could barely ever go and only one person could go. How do we access the access? And here is where it takes a turn. Here's where it shows that the access to the holy place is through one another. Now, there is not a temple where this presence, the manifest presence of God dwells. It is the spirit of God dwelling in the believers. We are carriers of Christ to one another. This is how we have access. It's not just in our own private times of devotion and prayer class. I I hope you do that. But, but, But there is something unique that can only happen when the body of Christ comes together and we encounter Christ together. As C.S. Lewis put it in Mere Christianity, Christ works on us in all sorts of ways. And we can all testify about that. But above all, he works on us through each other. Christ works on us in all sorts of ways, but above all, he works on us through each other. We are carriers of Christ. And now he's going to show us four characteristics of the community of God's people, of how we have access. Verse 24 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So there's this picture of life together and the importance of life together. There's actually four characteristics that, that pop out. So first of all, a, a community of God's people are, are to be a considering community. This is like uh, when you go and see a therapist and they just listen to you and they're taking notes and they're thinking, what can I say back to help this person? How do I help this person? He's saying that God's people, as we, as we gather, we should be intentional. Well, Lord, what, what do you want me to say? Give me eyes to see who needs to be built up, who, who needs to be loved well, who, who needs to just be welcomed into the household of God today. There is a, an intentionality to the community of God's people. And then he says, and s- s- how we may spur one another on. This is actually a unique word. It means to provoke, to agitate, to irritate, to, to the point of anger. You're like, well, no, I know some churches like that. No, that's not what, what he's getting at here. To spur one another on, it means like, hey, we, it's, it's simply to recognize that we're all in process. We're all disciple makers, but we're all 
being discipled as well. None of us have arrived spiritually. All of us have something to learn from, from one another. And all of us have blind spots. And the best way to deal with your blind spots is not to do life all by yourself. But, but to allow yourself to be in a part of an authentic community and have people that have access to you and they can say, hey, for the sake of your joy in Jesus, here's something I see in your life. Do, do you grant anybody in the church that kind of access? It'd be for your growth and for your joy. We will not grow being comfortable people. It's always in the uncomfortable places where we tend to grow, right? This is spur one another on. This is language of of sports and and coaching, right? A coach has you do what you do not want to do so that you can achieve what you want to achieve, right? If you've ever had a good coach, right? Like, I got to run more. I mean, we call them suicides, but I guess that's not PC anymore. Uh, Ladders, is that what they're called now, where you just run back and forth? You don't know you didn't do any running? You played baseball, that's right. Um, <laughs> in basketball, we had to run a lot uh, back and forth. And we didn't want to do that, but we wanted to win games, and you better get in shape. So, so there's uh, considering, there's spurring, uh, and then uh, there's encouraging. This is the opposite of spurring one another on. This is like, who, who do I need to come? The word is parakaleo. It means come alongside and call out. So now you can think of you're running a marathon and, and your family and friends at different points along the 26 and a half miles or whatever uh, come alongside you and they're running alongside you. And you're like, you got this. Only You're halfway there. Only five more miles. Only two more miles. This is parakaleo. This is encouraging. Like we all need this. Everybody on your left and right in the room today is not someone that doesn't need encouragement. Right? Or to put it another way, there's no one here that's just, oh, man, I've just been too encouraged. Can you just kind of be critical of me right now? Because I've been so encouraged this week. I just, yeah, I, my head's so big. Just criticize me. No, no, one, no one wants that. Like we all need encouragement. And, and in an authentic community, this is what happens. And then it says toward love and good deeds. This, this is working. We're a, a working community. So, so we're not just a social club. We're not just trying to learn things about the Bible and memorize verses. In the end, because we are carriers of Christ to each other, we're also carriers of Christ to the world, empowered by the Spirit of God, we are called to good works. Like we are, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our city. We are called to wash the feet of our city, right? And so we spur each other on. We figure out ways. Hey, how can we serve? How can we love this? How how can we be a witness to this community that Jesus is king? Now, this kind of community is both attractional and missional. Like people were made for authentic, to be known and to know. Like this is what, what our community hungers for. And so Jesus said, they will know you are Christians or my disciples by your love. So, so as we love one another, as we live these things out, encouraging and, and considering and spurring one another on, well, when outsiders come in, that, that's just gonna, they're, they're going to want to be a part of that. But it's also a missional force. We also want to get this out. We, we want to sp- spread this to our neighbors and to the nations because this is too good to hold on our own. So... Uh, I said I'd give you three ways that you can make disciples and grow disciples. Now, don't pull them up yet. I just brainstormed these. A good, probably a better thing for you to do is at your next gospel community or in a core group, think about them yourself. Brainstorm your own ways uh, of what it means and how we can be uh, both disciples and disciple makers. Again, I, I said that some of this is just a matter of tweaking a few things in your life. A matter of rearranging some things or or thinking differently about some things. Here's my three things. The first one is uh, we we need to plan. You need to plan your presence. Plan your presence. One of the things I've learned now being a Christian, I don't know, 30 years, is that uh, half, maybe three quarters of your discipleship and your growth is simply showing up. Simply looking at your calendar prioritizing your presence. And I'm not just talking about Sunday mornings, although the gathering of, of God's saints is a big deal. I mean, in our passage it says, uh, and, and do, not, uh, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. 
Like, like simply showing up is, is the first and the most important thing you could do. Show up in your gospel community. Show up with, with people. Show up in, in, in non-structured ways where you're doing life together. Plan your presence. Organize your schedule that way. I want to show another picture from Okinawa from a few years later. Uh, this one, now I had been an intern. I'd gone back to seminary, got my uh, degree, uh, moved back, took over. Drew is the six foot nine guy in the back there. Um, and I had brought him out to be a men's retreat speaker at Tokushiki Island. Beautiful place. But when I look at this picture of these guys I'm about to baptize, I have this weird thing go on in my heart and mind. On the one hand, man, I'm so joyful because I know these guys. I've did life with these guys. I've tracked with these guys. On the other hand, I am incredibly sorrowful because I know these guys. I know some have made shipwreck of their faith, have abandoned their families, have nothing to do with Jesus. And I've baptized, I've baptized them there. And when I baptized them, by all accounts that I could see, they were genuine followers of Jesus. They loved Jesus. They loved their family. They loved the church. But I'll tell you, the number one indicator on why these guys are, are, are mature followers of Jesus today and, and why they're, they've abandoned their faith is what they did with the local church. That's it. None of them wanted to make shipwreck of their faith. They just moved they moved to a different place. They came from a great church. They, 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 they got busy. Their kids' sports schedule kind of started, took it over their life. Like just, just one innocent decision after another. They never planned their presence and they abandoned their faith. You can see that after a track record of 25 years. And so you have to plan your presence. It is the, the most important thing you can do. If we are carriers of Christ to each other, if you want to encounter Christ, you have to be with God's people. So that's the, the first one. Number two, parent purposely. Oh, you got the third one too. So, my bad. Uh, parent purposely. Now, why do I say this? Because this, 94% of disciples come from Christian homes. Think about that. 94% of people who are followers of Jesus have come from a Christian home. If that's true, man, th this means uh, many things. Like God ordains the ends as well as the means. The, the, the role of parenting is huge. Like, like your highest call for your children is to point them to and, and show with your own life a delight in, a commitment to, a obedience to, a, a submission to King Jesus with your life and with your schedule. Partnering with the local church. Because it takes the whole church to make a whole disciple. Parents, you can't do this on your own. You need the church. And church, we need we need kids, whether you have kids or not, whether your kids are out of the house or you're not even at that stage yet, they're part of the community of God's people. Jesus said, hey, you want to you learn what it looks like to be part of the kingdom of heaven? Spend time with kids. Get on their levels. This is what Jesus says. Don't, don't stop them from coming to me. So, so we all have something to learn with from our littlest image bearers, and they have a lot to learn from us. And so we need to prioritize this. We need to make their discipleship our top priority. As awesome as it is to help Johnny hit a curveball or Susie get a 1500 on an SAT, that pales in comparison to knowing the king of the universe. Make sure you plan your presence and you prioritize your parenting around your discipling of your kids. And as a church, we should never miss an opportunity to love, encourage, spur on our littlest image bearers. And number three, I said practice hospitality because I couldn't come up with another P word. Uh, yeah, well, ChatGPT told me I should say promote participation. Uh, but I didn't go with that. Uh, practice hospitality. There, there is just something dynamic throughout all time, but especially in a culture that is so isolated and so lonely about opening your door and welcoming people to your kitchen table. Not with a fancy, you can't think Martha Stewart. Like, just think ordinary, we're having hamburgers and french fries tonight. Do you want to come over? Do you want to have a meal with us? 
You know, the, the Davidsons, for example, they'll do on, on the 4th of July, and we're going to do this too, roll out the griddle on the front yard and, and make pancakes for the neighbors as they come by. And this is practice hospitality. The biblical term of practice hospitality is both for the church, since we're carriers of Christ to each other, but it's also for strangers and for the outsiders. It's also for our church in general, right? Like when there's someone that comes into our gathering and you don't know them, it's okay to be like, hey, I don't know you. Uh, is this your first time? No, I've been coming for a year. Oh, cool. Do you still want to get lunch? Like that would be good. Or, oh, this is your first time? Well, great. I'm, we're glad you're here. Like we need to be a church that practice hospitality, that is warm and welcoming. Because we are a church that exists to enjoy Jesus and make disciples. And it takes a whole church to make a whole disciple. Let us consider, let us spur, let us encourage, let us work together for the glory of God and the joy of all people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us to that end. Yeah, Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, we want to be that kind of church. We want to be a, a church that is thoughtful in the way we will love, the way we will spur one another on, the way we will encourage one another the way that we will serve our city and one another. Lord, help us to um, not only play our, our part well in the story of God together as a church, but individually in the church. Lord, show us what that looks like. Show us how we can be a disciple and make disciples for your glory, for our joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.